Master Business Value Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition their business on their terms. Our mission was born from the lessons we've learned from over 100 business transactions, which fuels our desire to share our experiences and wisdom so you can succeed. Now here's your host, CEO of Mastery Partners, Tom Bronson. Hi, this is Tom Bronson, and welcome again to Maximize Business Value, a podcast for business owners who are passionate about building long-term sustainable value in their businesses. In this episode, I'd like to welcome our guest, Kent Barner, Principal at CIO Suite. That's a consulting and fractional CIO firm based here in Dallas. Now, Kent and I have known one another for several years, I think first meeting through Business Navigators, the servant leadership organization here in Dallas that you hear me talk about from time to time. Uh, But so in addition to being a true servant leader, Kent is a strategic thinker and works with companies to solve technology challenges. When Ken and I first talked about coming on this podcast well over a year ago, I might add, it's taken us a long time to get this scheduled. Uh, I asked him to focus on technology due diligence, which unfortunately, in my opinion, is often brushed over in M&A transactions. In my humble opinion, uh, not enough time is spent on technology due diligence. So today, Kent is going to help me kind of pull back the veil and explore this important topic for business owners. So welcome to Maximize Business Value, Kent. Thanks, Tom. Good to be here. It's good to have you. So before we dive into due diligence, why don't you tell us a little bit about CIO Suite? Sure. CIO Suite, I started in 2017. Uh, We're technology advisors to C-level executives and uh, business owners when technology matters, because a lot of times they don't really care. Uh, And you just mentioned in transactions, oftentimes they just overlook that thinking that everything will be be better on the back end after we acquire this. And and oftentimes, as we'll discuss, they find uh, some landmines that that they could have acquired a company more less expensively, let's put it that way, for less. Um, and and so, and generally what I find too is, and, and I'm sure we'll get into this, um, the the ac- acquiring company is more likely to do due diligence and the the guy that's selling it, I, you know, if, if they're coming in and, and they want me to look at their company, I'm getting ready to sell and it's a year out, then they're not going to spend the money. It's, they, they won't get ROI. So I know part of your philosophy and, and many um, advisors is, you know, five years, get it takes you five years to get ready to sell. Well, you should look at your technology platform at that time and make some decisions there so you can get the best value when you're exiting. Now, I'm not going to get into your business model, but I would disagree with you that uh, that it doesn't give an ROI. And I know that's not you. That's the way CEOs think yeah. uh, sometimes. But it, it can give a massive ROI because if you can identify and find some problems early and and invest and make the fixes, it could have a dramatic impact on the outcome of the, the enterprise value. And so, so I would argue that... Uh, and you already know this, but this is for the sake of our audience, I would argue that do, having those uh, conversations well in advance uh, is so very important and it can deliver a great ROI for business owners who are thinking about selling in the future. I agree. It's just like you got to get your accounting books in order, right? You, you can't, I mean, all those things that you need to do uh, well in advance of your exit plan. So um but, but to your other point, the people that are receptive to the service are the people that are acquiring because they don't want to acquire some you know, bad technology problem. So it's unfortunate, yeah. but that's the way it works out. Yeah, I, I, I totally understand. So, so what's your background and why did you start CIO Suite? So um, I, I was in corporate America for about 35 years. And most of that time, since the early 90s, I was a CIO. That's about when the CIO term was coined, Chief Information Officer. And so uh, the last company I was with, they were imploding and I saw that coming. (laughs) So I decided I needed to do something. And so I I jumped out of there uh, at the end of 2016. They were my first client. (laughs) So I did a transition with them for a few months uh, in 2017. So in April of 2017, 
I kind of started trying to figure out how to do business. And it's, it's totally different, as you know, uh, as a corporate executive, everybody's after me, you know, now I'm, it turned, you know, flip the coin on the other side. Now I'm trying to figure out how to get to people like me. Right. Uh, right. so anyhow, it's been a, it's been a fun journey. Um, and I've, and generally there's, I'm the only CIO in CIO suite, but I've had other CIOs with me from time to time. Uh, and that's been fun working with them. Um, I, I do fractional chief information officer, which is kind of, you know, maybe it's four hours a week or something like that. Um, I, I right now have an interim gig where I am their acting CIO and I have about 15 people reporting to me and managing all their vendors. My, my plan there is to get rid of me eventually. Um, but the company's just having to get some things in line first. So, uh, and then I do projects, you know, I've, I've, I've worked for other CIOs who just need bandwidth or advice or whatever the case may be. Uh, but generally, um, call it the mid-market, $50 million in revenue and up. Um, and I've worked for a large, um, with Graystar, they're you know worldwide. I've done work for them as well. So pretty broad range, but generally in that 50 to probably $150 million revenue, because eventually they'll have their own CIO. Right. So this interim gig, that's where they had a CIO who left and you're just Fall filling in temporarily, or no? They've never had a CIO. Oh, got it. <laughs> and so they were kind of like, "Well, what does that mean? What do you do?" And they had all kinds of problems, and uh, they still have problems. I'm trying to fix, um, uh, but you know, now they see the value, and uh, so it's Work it's been it's been fun <laughs> trying to, yeah. Uh, I imagine, though, that uh, since you've sat so long in the CIO uh, seat, I mean years before you started this it's you know almost 30 years of of doing that or 20 years of doing that before you started this uh does that make it easier to have conversations with cios because you're you basically sat in their shoes well it depends on how secure they are i guess sat in their seat or walked in their shoes i'm mixing my metaphors yeah um well if a lot of them are insecure. And so they don't want me around, you know, I don't want you in my backyard. I'm the CIO. I don't want you telling me what's wrong. Now I have worked for CIOs and they're just more secure. It's, it's just a, a different attitude. And so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't come across as a threat. I, I don't think, um, but you know, it's just kind of an odd, an odd thing. I know I'm threatened by you right now. And then we're just on zoom. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> No need. Yeah, no, Non-threatening guy. I already started with it. You're a great uh, servant leader. That's a shame that some folks don't see that. Well, let's let's jump into the deep end and let's talk about technology and due diligence. So one of the reasons that I think technology due diligence is so glossed over is that uh, post-acquisition and integration are not kind of clearly defined in advance. They're all excited and it's uh, they're, they're, it's romantic to do the acquisition. We're doing acquisitions. We're doing M&A and yep. they go out and they do that and they don't define what the backside of it looks like in advance. So when you're called in by a client to do some technical due diligence, tell us kind of where you start. Sure, sure. So I approach it from the business side and, and you know, technology, I, I can figure that out pretty easy. So I just need to understand what the plan is for the, the acquisition. So, you know, talking from the, the acquirer's end, you know, are you going to fully integrate the company? Is it going, so you bring them into all your systems, right? Or, or are you going to adopt some of theirs? You know, how, how is that going to happen? Um, are you planning on divesting of certain parts of the business because they're not strategic for you or whatever the reason may be? Um, or, or are you just going to leave them alone and just run them as an independent business? And so depending on what that business strategy might be, and there's probably some other flavors in there, that's, I, I go in with that lens. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to divest, you know, you're not going to spend a bunch of money on that. You may to get better value, right? Just depends on when you're going to exit them. So there's just different reasons and different views when you're starting to, to do it. So we're not even talking about technology yet, right? It's really what's the business strategy I love that. It kind of forces uh, the uh, the acquirer, if you will, 
to think about what the end game is. And that's, that's unfortunate. That's kind of one of the, one of the side effects of, of M and a too often, they don't think about that end, end game and what, what is our strategy beyond close, you know, cause close getting to the close, in my opinion, is the easy part as I, I actually do a, a talk at, at uh, various shows and, and events and whatnot on buying companies is easy because I think it's easy. That's the easy part. The hard part is the post integration. But if you don't start with understanding what the end game looks like, uh, then post integration can take on a life or, or post acquisition integration phase can take on just a life of its own. So I love the fact that you kind of force them into thinking about what are we going to do with this? Because if they are going to divest, that's going to give you clues about where you need to spend time. But if they're not, if they're keeping the technology or, or keeping it or keeping it and operating it as a separate uh, entity, then that gives you some idea of where you need to focus to make certain that uh, that you're delivering value uh, in the due diligence. Am I, am I right on with this? Oh, yeah, definitely. And and I think you, you said it earlier that, you know, they're all enamored when they're doing the transaction and don't let... Don't let technology get in the way of a good transaction. You know, that unfortunately is many times what people say or think at least. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, they, but it costs them on the back end. And, and then you can have failures, not just from technology, but, you know, we'll talk about another topic here. Culture, uh, you know, is a big piece of that as well. Yeah. The, uh, uh, I will tell you that, that I've kind of done uh, all of the above, the descriptions that you gave, you know, keep, uh, divest, operate separately. And that drove kind of what our uh, technology due diligence was all about. For example, you know, we bought in, our, in my last company, we bought 17 companies that were providing different types of technologies to restaurants, retailers, and wineries. In some of those companies that we bought, we knew that within 30 days, we were going to end of life products and switch them on, switch the customers onto something better. You know, perhaps it was an old tire technology. So we didn't spend tons of time. We made sure that that there weren't any skeletons in the closet, but we but we weren't spending tons of time thinking about how do we take this product forward because we knew that we were going to abandon that product. And so, yeah. uh, so it's important to really kind of start with that. You mentioned uh, kind of another topic that I think is super important, um, and, and most people don't think about this in terms of technology, but is is culture important in the process? Oh yeah, definitely. It's it's right up there with the strategy. I, you know, I, I kind of approached strategy first and then culture second. And one of the things I say is, you know, the er, it, when I was in corporate America doing strategic acquisitions, it was me and HR that showed up first. And you know, after the deal guys decided we we're going to get married, we would we would drop in and then start doing the real due diligence. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I'd like to do is interview all the kind of key stakeholders and, and get to know a little bit about them and how the culture that you, you know, just by interviewing them, you kind of figure out what the culture of the company is, good or bad. Um, and, and so in addition to just finding out about the systems and where the shortcomings are that they think and where the good ones that they think and all, you know, just kind of get people's opinion. Um, but yeah, culture is, is huge. And, and. I would I would say, and you would probably know, but many transactions fail because of the cultural issues or, you know, the post transaction integration. Maybe it takes too long. You know, you don't you want to do it as fast as you can, especially if you have to do something with people. Uh, and so, you know, culture is real important. And I, I've, I've got a couple of examples of interesting culture. <laughs> oh, I'd so, love to hear those. Bring so, it. <laughs> so one of them. It's probably a terrible, a bad example. So the, there was a company we were acquiring. Um, it was on the West Coast. That doesn't matter. But, you know, we we liked the kind of the, the mix between the two companies. But we sensed that the culture was a bit of a challenge. And so and it was with the the top executives, top two executives, to be specific. And they were the part the partners of the company. And so after the transaction closed, we had to get rid of them quickly, you know, now we packaged them out. We treated them very fairly, um, but they were really angry about that. <laughs> and so one, one weekend shortly thereafter that they left, um, somebody broke into the office and vandalized it. 
and it was just this is kind of disgusting but somebody stood up on the conference room table and took a leak yeah <laughs> oh my gosh i mean that was me? that was horrible right and we had to get the police involved and all you know so anyhow the 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 suspects were those two gentlemen uh and so that's a terrible example but um you know it has nothing to do with technology it's just a people issue wow. now the the other people were glad that they were gone right i mean it was just a really bad environment and so you know after we got over that we had a good integration so that was a one example and then another example that's kind of more technology related so i was interviewing the it director and you know i have a long list of things i ask and and one of the things was well let me see your inventory of your hardware and so he whips it out and i start looking at it and i'm like well you've got like a hundred people and you've got a hundred desktops and then you got like 10 laptops. What's that story? What's up with that? And he says, well, the owners or the owner doesn't believe that people's he's insecure about people having laptops and he's afraid, you know, they're going to walk off with the data or whatever that, you know, whatever it is that, I mean, it's just a weird quirk as far as I'm concerned. And so the 10 laptops were they would, if you needed to do something remotely for a short period of time, we'd give you a laptop, but you have to bring it back. And, and so our cult, culture was just the opposite. We gave everybody laptops. That was part of our DR strategy because mobility is key. And that was probably six years ago before pandemic, way before pandemic. And so anyhow, well, we would have had to buy a hundred laptops <laughs> to kind of bring those into the fold. Uh, that's not why the transaction didn't happen, but that's one of those indicators that, it, and it also points to culture, right? It's this guy's that paranoid, that controlling, maybe we don't want him as part of the ongoing team, right? So right. Um, kind of crazy stuff you discover. You just have to ask questions and kind of look at the signs. Wow. That, uh, so, so who would have thought that culture is important in technology, but th these issues, of course, that you mentioned, some of them certainly related to technology, but, but culture overall, we've done a lot of podcasts on culture and I would encourage you to go back and, and listen to, I think it may have been episode two or three with, uh, uh, with um, Mark Midford uh, at HR mm. Catalyst. We did a whole uh, podcast on culture and building a great culture. And so perhaps that company should have uh, listened to that podcast before you <laughs> So I would have had to create it in advance. So now I know we don't have time to kind of go it through your entire checklist because I'm going to imagine it's lots and lots and lots of items. But why don't you give us some examples of things that you might review during a due diligence? Sure, sure. Well, um, yeah, I just mentioned the the hardware. So you need to get an inventory and you need to you have it aged when it was acquired, if it's still under warranty, you know, kind of what are what are some of the signs and and we'll talk some more about that in a minute but um so you look at the hardware all of the software you want to get you know all the licensing make sure they have appropriate licensing you know some people like copy software and do things they shouldn't be doing right and 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 also the currency in other words how current are the applications are they are they the most modern versions of that uh and and so one thing that Oh, well, let me go, keep going <laughs> and, um, you know, make sure maintenance contracts are current uh, because that might be a, a big expense. Like if you have to renew a bunch of Cisco uh, maintenance contracts, they're quite expensive. Um, you know, so, so you look at a lot of different aspects, but um, I, I'll give you a, a, another good, bad example. I hate to give you the bad examples, but um, so there's this company that I, I did some work for and they, acquired this company and they didn't do any technology due diligence. And so they were having problems onboarding customers. So they had, when they acquired the company, they generally had just a few customers for 15 years or something like that. And they had this proprietary application that they used to service, to provide their service. And so, um, but they were having trouble onboarding new customers. That was the symptom. And so um, I went in there and uh, actually with another CIO at the time, and we were, we were kind of interviewing all the, the stakeholders, trying to understand where the problem was. And then eventually, you know, it was this application. It was taking them months to onboard new customers. And so I, I brought in an outside consultant and we did a review of the application. 
well, it was written, it's proprietary. It was written 20 years ago. And, and so it was an old technology. And, and consequently, it, it wasn't designed for onboarding a bunch of new customers. It was designed to handle two or three customers, and that was it. And so it, essentially, we had to figure out a way to improve that process. So it was literally taking, when I got there, some of them had been onboarding for four to five months. And then, and then probably six months when it was all said and done. And so what I did there was uh, I just had to throw horsepower at it. And so I had to develop a, a strategy of build and run is what I call it. And so I have a team that's doing the build for new customers. And then the, the other team that's doing the run, the day-to-day -day operations and problems had to outsource, you know, uh, I had in, people in India working on it. I mean, it was, I had to, they had to spend a lot of money just to be able to maintain the customer base. And so consequently, you know, they will eventually replace that application with something more modern, you know, back to that, make sure it's modern. Uh, and, and it'll cost them a ton of money. And so if you think about if it's a million, $2 million, right. And you acquired, you're, you're acquiring this company and you know that in advance, well, I would, I would, you know, <laughs> claw that back on the transaction price. I'd say, well, instead of 5 million, I'm going to give you 3 million because, you know, I've got to do this major upgrade to, to the software. And that's just one example. They had a lot of XP machines and, you know, just, just stuff like you just wouldn't ever dream of. And um, so that's a, that's one example. And that's a very expensive uh, oversight from a technology due diligence. Wow. Um, another one is probably, well, I'll just talk about technology debt. I'll just get into that right now. Oh, please do. I want you to define what, uh, what technical debt or technology debt is. Yeah, so te technical debt is the lack of spending on technology to the point where it falls so far behind that you have this all this old technology and you're going to have to upgrade it to modern technology for many reasons, like one of them I just gave you. And so um, that's a nice way of saying they haven't invested. And so I've been on both sides of the transaction. And, and in one case where we were selling the company, we were cutting expenses on everything to make the GNA look better. And so we probably quit investing three years out. Well, if, if you come in and you're doing due diligence for the acquirer, you might discover you're going to have to replace a bunch of equipment, upgrade a bunch of software you know, a bunch of expenses to get out of that technology debt that you, that the other company created just to make the, the sale look better from a GNA standpoint. Uh, and so um, you got to really look at that technology debt. And, and if you're the acquirer, you probably want to adjust the purchase price for those areas where you have technology debt. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. There's um, of course, having owned a technology company, we understood technical debt and, and, uh, and a lot of times that was some of the tired old software. I, I've got a client, uh, when you brought this up, having, you know, old stuff that's been around, I've got a client recently that I was talking to and I said, I said, how easy is it to pull this data out of, in fact, it was a, it's kind of a, uh, a uh, call center, right? And I said, I want to know, you know, how quickly you guys uh, answer calls, how many, what's a call volume and, uh, and how, what's the time to resolution? I said, can your software produce those very, what I think are very standard simple, things, you know, standard, <laughs> simple reports, right? Right. Well, we actually bought this software in like, you know, 1989 and, and I said, well, what are you using? He told me, I said, but that company's still around. Yeah, but they just want so much money to upgrade it. So we've just been using it, you know, the, the way it is. And we don't know if we can pull any reports or not. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> right. We need to invest in that. Right. And it, because we've got to have the data uh, and, yep. and that's a perfect example of technical debt, right? That, oh, yeah. That's something that would instantly, any buyer that came in and looked at that knows instantly I'm going to have to make that investment. So if you make it in advance, then at least it's not an adjustment on the purchase price. And so, uh, uh, wow, that's a, that's a great example. Yeah. And, and, you know, have you heard of CMMC? So it's a like cyber, cyber maturity matrix. I can't remember the, the, what it stands for. <laughs> I know what it is. 
And right. so if you're a government contractor, you have to be CMMC compliant. It was supposed to happen this year. You're supposed to be compliant. And so what a lot of companies used to do is just self-certify and they'd say, yeah, we're good. We're good. Well, this year they had to have an audit. And so, <laughs> and, and the, the governing bodies having a hard time getting enough auditors to actually do this. So it, it's slower than it should be. But if you're a government contractor and all of a sudden you have to invest several million dollars just to be CMMC compliant so that you can do the business, I think it's going to whittle the field down a little bit um, because people aren't going to be able to step up and get that stuff in, in compliance. You know, they'll, they'll, they've probably still running those XP machines, right. And just trying to squeeze every last ounce of them that they, you know, so it's penny wise pound foolish at the end of the day. Wow. All right. Well, we're up on a break. Uh, let's take a quick break. We're talking to Ken Kent Barner, and we'll be back in 30 seconds. Every business will eventually transition, some internally to employees and managers, and some externally to third-party buyers. Mastery Partners equips business owners to maximize business value so they can transition their businesses on their terms using our four-step process. We start with a snapshot of where your business is today. Then we help you understand where you want to be and design a custom strategy to get you there. Next, we help you execute that strategy with the assistance of our amazing resource network. And ultimately, you'll be able to transition your business on your terms. What are you waiting for? More time? More revenue? If you want to maximize your business value, it takes time. Now is that time. Get started today by checking us out at www.masterypartners.com or email us at info at masterypartners.com to learn more. We're back with Kent Barner, principal at CIO Suite, and we're talking about technology and technology due diligence. So, Kent, let's talk about the elephant in the room cybersecurity. You know, everybody wants to talk about cybersecurity or, or they don't want to talk about it, uh, but, but we're going to talk about it here. I don't think we can go a week without hearing a story. And, and, you know, if you watch any TV or listen to any news or read in a newspaper, we can't go a week without hearing a story about cybersecurity or a breach at some high profile business. Home Depot a few years ago, it's Starwood come to mind. Uh, I have my own horror stories, by the way, in businesses. Uh, let me share that with you real quick. Sure. Uh, I bought a company in 2010, uh, and we discovered about, let's see, nine months later that the company had been breached uh, prior to the acquisition. Uh, and uh, and there were uh, maybe a, uh, less than 100 customers impacted, but it was credit card uh, theft, right? And so that's huge. And that's PCI compliance and all of that. Um, and uh, fortunately, our agreements were written so that, uh, that we could claw that back against the uh, purchase price. However, um, what, what happened was they, the company knew about this uh, problem that they had and had addressed it with their customers many, as much as two years prior, they had identified the security vulnerability and addressed it with the clients. But because the the uh, it was um, hosted locally, their software was hosted locally, not in the cloud, uh, they couldn't push an update, but they required an update. And uh, they had uh, every um, client that did the update was you know not breached, but every client that didn't do the update um, was uh, breached. And so, uh, but we actually had some, uh, here's where it can be very helpful. Uh, we had some that snubbed us that said, now nah, we're going to, you know, we'll handle this ourselves or we have our own security people and we'll handle this ourselves. But we had uh, used our um, uh, call log uh, software, our, our uh, CRM to track all of these notifications. And we knew when they were opened, we knew how, what the responses were, we had all that stuff. And so we actually had a, a chain uh, on the West Coast that their entire chain was breached, but it was because their internal CIO said, we'll handle this ourselves our own way. And, uh, and of course we had the evidence of that. And so we ultimately were not at fault, nor was the prior company. Um, but but the, I mean, it, there's horror stories uh, that go around that run rampant about breaches. And of course, for a company like mine that was doing technology for restaurants, retailers, and wineries, that can put you out of business. 
So um, how do you explore cybersecurity, the, the whole topic of cybersecurity in due diligence? And more importantly, how can business owners protect themselves now and know that they're protected? Yep, yep. And like I said, it's hot, it's a hot topic and it has been for years now and it's only getting worse. And so um, I would tell you that I come in at a high level and look at their, call it their cybersecurity posture is what I refer to it as. And I can determine a lot of just from that level, you know, what are your policies and procedures? How often do you do, you know, intrusion detection and extrusions and, you know, different things? And mo most of the time it's like, well, we don't do that. You know, we had never done that. What are you talking about? You know, vulnerability assessments, those, those types of things. And so you can tell just from asking some questions what their posture is. And then generally, if I'm, if I sense that things are really bad, <laughs> I will bring in a, a, a professional, a certified cybersecurity person and dig deeper into that. Um, but you definitely want to ask the, the simple question of, have you ever had a breach? And if they deny it, then, okay, well, I've asked the question and you might put something in your reps and warranties about that. Because just like in your case, it you didn't discover that until nine months later, right? And so the other thing you mentioned was the Starwood acquisition by Marriott. And that's one that anybody can study. They're a public company, but Marriott acquired Starwood. Uh, Starwood wasn't aware that they had a, had a breach. And so post-transaction, it's discovered. Now Marriott's on the hook for the, the, the cost of the breach, right? And in addition to that, they keep getting breached. <laughs> and so uh, if you go through their filings, I went through a free, few years of their filings, just their annual statements, um, just because I was preparing for uh, a cybersecurity presentation. And the numbers were they started off, you know, you're in denial when you're the, the one that gets, uh, it's only $50,000. It's not a big deal. It was a $6 billion transaction. We shouldn't worry about that. Well, the number gets up pretty high and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to quote a number, but it, it would, it would be a significant purchase price deduction just in anticipation of that payment or escrow it or some come up with some way of deferring that that or avoiding that cost um but it's all it's in all of their filings because they have to report it and every year it gets higher and higher and higher and then you know oftentimes people have cyber liability insurance or cybersecurity insurance and but it's hard to recover on that because a lot of times they'll prove that you weren't diligent in protecting your environment and so, you know, you got to be real careful about paying, paying for those policies and understand the, the fine print. So when you go to go to claim that, uh, but, you know, little things like, you know, what's your endpoint security? You know, what, what do you put on your PCs and your workstations? You know, is that current? Um, do you train your employees? A lot of companies don't even provide training for their employees. And that's the employees, the weakest link in the chain, right? They're, they're the ones that's going to mess up the most. Um, you know, the, the standard, you've heard a million stories about the phishing attacks through email. Oh yeah. And, and you put, you can put things in place that aren't even technology related. They're just good controls and processes. So a good example, you see a lot of things, uh, about the email that goes into the, let's call it the CFO's office or to an accountant from the CFO. And, and it's, and it says, you know, Hey, I need you to wire this money somewhere. That is so classic and it happens all the time. And then um, a, another one would be somebody changes their uh, wiring instructions. And so that happens a, a lot. And so consequently, what you do is you end up wiring money somewhere that they shouldn't be getting it. Well, the simple controls on both of those is two factor human in, engagement, right? I'm going to call that CFO or CEO. Uh, yeah, it may be annoying, but I'd rather do that than get asked to leave because I've screwed up. Um, or, you know, in the case of changing the, the instructions on wiring, place a call to the company, to the person that you know at the company and make sure that that's valid. So there are simple things that aren't technology related that can help you avoid a, a, a breach, if you will. Uh, thanks, by the way. You just brought back a, a painful memory uh, for me. Um, we had just hired a new CFO. 
Uh, and we had a, 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 for all intents and purposes, a kind of an accounting manager, a bookkeeper, you know, m- more than a bookkeeper, but more of an accounting manager who reported to that CFO. I happened to get on a plane to fly to the West Coast. So I was literally on an airplane when an email came in that looked like it came from me to that accounting manager saying I needed her to wire uh, $10,000. Thank God it was only $10,000, but $10,000 to this account uh, right away, right? And so she takes the email, goes to the brand new CFO uh, and says, Tom sent this, we need to take care of it. So, well, why didn't he send it to me? I don't know, but uh, he's in the air. So, you know, we need it. And he wanted this done before he lands kind of a thing. So we need to do it now. And of course, they carried out the instruction, 10,000 bucks. uh, And and that was that, right? I mean, it was just basically $10,000 off the bottom line because there's no way to recover that stuff. No. uh, Once it's gone, because it it wasn't in that account for more than a nanosecond before it was swept somewhere else, right? Right. so uh, yeah, those those kind of things. Even and this is a smart, intelligent accounting manager, uh, sure, but sure. those kind of things can get anybody. So yeah, I routinely uh, when I had an IT staff, I would get an email, and if it even if it was from some name I knew or somebody I knew, I would actually send it over to IT and go, "Hey, would you make sure that this attachment doesn't have anything weird?" Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, And they could take it and isolate it somewhere else off the internet, open it and look at it and go, yeah, no, it's good. So, uh, or yeah, you're, thank you for sending this to me, but (laughs) it's, it's that human training, right? How do we get people to stop doing things like that? And, and because genuinely, when I saw the email, it looked legitimate, it would spoofed my address. Right. And, 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 you know, of course, me in hindsight, I've got the benefit of 2020 when I look backwards, right? I go, yeah. if, if I sent you that email right then, that must have meant that I was connected. Why didn't you email me back? Yeah. You know, because, and if I didn't respond, then you would something's know that, fishy. yeah, something's fishy. So, oh, well, it was a $10,000 lesson to learn. I can't remember whether we, uh, filed an insurance claim on that or not, but uh, I, I don't, I don't know if they insure against stupidity, but uh, but that was certainly <laughs> a, a moment of stupidity. But all right, so talking about cyber crimes, and and we've used a couple of really big examples here: Home Depot and and Starwood. These are giant companies. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, fortunately in my case, we wrote that into the reps and warranties. We knew because there could be the possibility of what we were doing. I'd be surprised if uh, Marriott didn't do that in their Starwood, but maybe they didn't. Uh, but, um, but many business owners, particularly small business owners think that the cyber criminals are just out looking for the big payday and they go, Oh, I'm way too small. They're not interested in me. So I shouldn't be concerned about cybersecurity. How would you address that if somebody, if a a small business owner told you that? Well, I've had that happen. And so I was at a, well, it was one of the B2B CFO conferences. And I was sitting next to this guy who was a business owner and the gentleman speaking was talking about cybersecurity. And um, he was talking about it. You know, most companies should count on spending about 3% of their revenue on cybersecurity. And most companies spend like half a percent of their revenue, you know, the small to medium sized companies. Right. And so he, he said, well, I've got three companies and that's just going to be a lot of money. And I said, well, it might be a lot of money if you don't, you know? And so I said, I, I tell you what, we can meet and, and maybe we can package all three companies together in some technology and get a better price. And he said, Oh, that's an interesting idea. So call me when you're, you know, after this is over. And so next week I call him and he doesn't return my calls. Well, you know, I'm used to that. You are too. Right. Oh yeah. And so, but I keep, oh, everybody on. takes my calls, Kent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tom's yeah. calling. I better go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my goodness. Um, and so, but one time after I called, you know, several times over the course of a few months and one time he answered and he went, gosh, you just don't know how timely this is. And I was like, well, what, what happened? And, and he says, well, we got a, we got a ransomware <laughs> in a factory. So he's not producing. Right. And, and I said, well, do you want me to send in an incident response team to take care of it? He says, no, no, I've got a, I've got an IT guy that's going to do that for me. And I said, okay, well, that's good. Um, but if you want to talk about it after y'all get it all squared away, we can kind of see if we can do something for you long-term. 
And then his next factory got hit and all three factories ended up getting hit eventually because now they know the, 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 the DNA and the formula to get in. Right. And so, but anyhow, so he, he said that he paid, I don't remember the exact numbers, but let's say he paid $10,000 to the IT consultant to remediate it. And the ransomware was $5,000. So the IT company turns around and pays the 5,000 and pockets five and didn't do anything. You know, it was just, it's terrible. It's a terrible story. And then I hear later, that they got into his, his bank account and, oh. and then it got it to hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and this is a you know, relatively small to medium sized business. And so if you don't do something, it can be very costly. Right. So yeah. those are, that's just a real bad example. And those are um, small businesses, you know, for, for yeah. a big business, for someone like Marriott, we're not worried or home Depot. We're not worried that they're going to go out of business as a result. It could cost them, thousands to millions of dollars uh, in damages and, 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 and reparations. But for small businesses, I've, I've actually seen some small restaurants that, that were breached in one way or another, some of them even very low tech ways, right. That, uh, that it's put them out of business. Sure. Oh yeah. Uh, there's a large percent, like, I don't remember if it's 50%, but there's a high percentage that don't recover uh, because it, it's cost them so much. Um, and, and then, you know, you, when you look at some st statistics, I think uh, about 70% of the small to medium sized enterprises get breached. And wow. it, because it, they're the easy targets because of their attitude about, I don't want to invest. You know, uh, I was talking to a guy from Bank of America that was on their security team. They have 2,500 people just on the security team. And, and that wasn't enough. They were trying to hire more. And this was a couple of years ago. So, you know, when somebody's thinking, well, I'm a small company. Nobody's really going to want me. Nobody's going to come after me. No, you're the target. You're the easy target. Let me get, I, I'll take a hundred small businesses over that one, you know, gorilla, you know, a bank of America or whatever. They're, they're too hard to get into. You know, it's, it's a sense of accomplishment when a hacker gets into it. <laughs> and so there's some twisted thinking going on there, but you know, in, in, you know, in Russia, they have companies that are legitimate companies that all they do is try and breach our companies. Right. And, yep. but, and they, and they, and they're very, it's, it's weird to say this, but they're ethical in how they do their business. So I'm going to ransomware you. If you pay the, the money, I'll, I'll turn the keys over to you and, and let you recover. And so they're operating, you know, in good, <laughs> in good faith, as bad as they are. Right. And, but, that's, you know, they're, they're like legitimate companies that are public facing and that's what they do. Now, if you, if, if one day I should show you a presentation I've done and it's actually a, a real demonstration. So I go into the dark web and show you what you can find in the dark web. And it's a lot of bad stuff, but it's easy to get into. Like I could do it right now while we're talking and it's, but what you see in there, you know, whether it's from human trafficking, drugs, arms, but you can hire people just to go hack people. And, and, and one time I was working at a company and they received all their payments online from, through a, through a service it, you know, it was, it was an apartment company. And so at the first of every month, what was happening is that software company was getting denial of service attacks, which means their, their servers can't respond. Right. And so the payments couldn't get processed. You know, we had, very high end communities all over the U S and we weren't able to get our rents the first part of the month because the software company we we're using couldn't process them. Well, what we, what we think and what the FBI thought was one of their competitors who didn't want them in the business because they were kind of a new business, a new, new entry into this business. It was hiring somebody to do a, a denial of service attack on them. And you can just go on the dark web and find those people. Wow. It's a whole different side of the gig economy, right? <laughs> oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Good and, Lord. If you, and you just don't know how, how close it is to you all the, all the time. I know. I crazy. don't, I don't really want to see one of your demonstrations on dark web. I've seen that <laughs> at various shows and, and I totally get that. And uh, just it's, it's tough. People it's, need to realize that this is a real threat. Doesn't matter the size of your business. If, even if you're small, you made an excellent point. You don't probably have the security. And so it's so much easier for them to get in and they go after those small businesses as well. Oh, yeah. So for business owners that are thinking about 
selling their business in the next few years? How can they be proactive about technology due diligence before they go to market? And kind of what do you think is the impact of that? We talked a little bit about that before, but let's talk about the meat and potatoes of that. Yeah. So, you know, hire someone to come in and do an assessment. You just need a a professional. Uh, Oftentimes, you know, a small business, small to medium sized business has a managed service provider. Uh, and if they're a good managed service provider, they keep your technology current, but there's plenty of them that aren't good. And, and some of the problem is the owner wants the low cost provider. And so they get a low cost solution and the quality suffers. And so I would, I would argue that you should hire a third party, another third party, because you don't want the, the fox watching the hen house, so to speak. Right. And so bring somebody in that's independent, let them do an assessment. And then, you know, look at kind of what the results are and, and there, there, there'll be, be dollars likely to spend. And if you've got a five-year runway, it might make sense to do those things early and or over those five years, you know, chip away at the, probably do a cost risk analysis, where's the highest risk and, you know, get, get the best value for your dollar. Uh, and then, and then that would probably impact your, your price as you exit, you know, whether it's, is it. 10x or, you know, I don't know what that number might be. It all depends on kind of what the revenue of the company is, EBITDA, all those good things, right? Um, but, you know, at least be, at least know in advance where you're headed and don't be surprised. Like we were talking earlier about the 17% that actually make a transaction happen. You know, that other 83% probably has a lot of skeletons that they didn't even know they had, right? So, they get to the transaction. Somebody says, well, I'm going to have to spend, you know, $2 million to upgrade that software or replace it. So uh, I'm not going to offer you what you think you're worth. Right. Yep. That, uh, that happens so frequently. And of course, what, what Kent's talking about is the 83% of business transactions that fail to reach the finish line, you know, 83% of all attempted transactions don't uh, get all the way to a close only 17% do. And I think that the, the, the seven of the 17% that do, <clears throat> they're very proactive. They do things like this technology audit in advance, right? They, they yeah. think about, they get their systems up to date. They, uh, they update, they, they document the processes. They, uh, run, are well-run businesses, and so, so if you want to be in that elusive seventeen percent club, like like the business owners that successfully transition, think about doing this kind of thing in advance. So, before we go, what you know, there are other companies out there, other technology consultants, other CIO uh, firms that they could talk to. What sets CIO suite apart from other folks that do the same thing? So um, I would tell you a couple of things, you know, when you're talking to consultants, even people like yourself, it's all based on your experience and, you know, the value you bring to the table because of your experience. And so you have to look at that. I think that's one point. Uh, one of my approaches is always I, I look at technology from a business perspective, not a technology perspective. Uh, here's a good example. I, I, I was interviewing for a job and it was a CIO of a large company. And this, I was interviewing with the CFO and he kept talking about his technology. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's great. You know, and, but tell me about the business, you know, tell me about what the strategy is for the business. You tell me you're going to grow, how are you going to grow? How are you going to fund it? All those types of things, not what kind of PCs do you buy? And he was more enamored with that kind of stuff. And so the headhunter that sent me there said, well, they didn't, they didn't think you cared about their technology. And I said, well, I, I really don't. That's the easy part. <laughs> we need to understand the business and how technology fits with the business and then come up with you know, the appropriate strategy. So I think that's a little different uh, approach in, that some companies don't take. They kind of get more enamored with the technology. Also, in, um, in my years of experience, so some people say the life of the CIO is three to five years. And so I was with my first group of the management team for 23 years and then my second group for 10 years. And so I'm kind of a, I think that's a good track record that I didn't get fired. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if, if that's a selling point, I guess, uh, yeah. you know, so and anyhow, I've, I've got a, a track record that, that shows that I'm, I'm a kind of a pretty good guy. I, and I then, and then start, start with the business uh, yeah. first. Right. I love that. Oh, Something yeah. else you wanted to add there. I'm just a lot of fun too. So. 
<laughs> well, you and I can debate that. We don't have time to get into that. So, right. Uh, so one last business question. Sure. This podcast is all about maximizing business value. What is the one most important thing that you recommend business owners do to build long-term value in their business? So keep your technology current. That's one thing that I would highly recommend. And, and, and then hire people that are qualified to support your technology. Don't, don't, don't hire that least common denominator, the cheapest, you know, that's always a bad, a bad approach. Racing to the bottoms is a terrible idea. You get what you pay for. Um, and that's not just for me, it's hiring an MSP, hiring a consultant for whatever you're doing. Um, so those are a couple of things that I would advise. Those are great pieces of advice. Now we've gotten kind of all the way to the end and uh, I don't know if you listen to the podcast or, or certainly our, our long-term listeners always are looking forward to the answer to this question. I have to ask you a bonus question, Ken. Are you ready? Go. Okay. What personality trait has gotten you into the most trouble through the years? Oh. And I'm anxious to hear this. <laughs> um, probably no fear, no you know, fear. And so I'll do, I'll do stupid things if I'm, <laughs> if I'm challenged, especially as you're growing up and in college and, you know, I, I, I can't tell us some of those stories. So, uh, but then also in, in, in business, you know, I jumped out of a corporate pretty, pretty cush position and said, I'm just going to go do this. And, uh, and I think I've uh, achieved success. Uh, so, but if That's I was, awesome. af if I was afraid, I think, uh, you know, I'd second guess myself all the way. So I love that. I'm glad you're not my airline pilot. <laughs> my, my dad, my dad was a fighter pilot. So I think oh, that's where really? I get it. Excellent. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now they have to go in with no fear, but that's a different kind of thing. So uh, yeah. So how can our viewers and listeners get in touch with you? So uh, CIO suite.com. So the letter C I O S U I T E.com. Uh, and not uh, S W E E T. Right. -E -E I actually, I actually got that URL. So Do you really? <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I was going to use it for promotional. You know, give out a candy bar and have CIO suite, and then oh, it would awesome. take you to my website. <laughs> uh, and then 214-952-3190. Uh, that's my phone number, my cell phone. And then uh, Kent Barner at CIO suite.com awesome. or call you and they can, and you can get them to me. Yeah, you're you're stealing my line. That's it. Okay. You're exactly right. You must have listened to my podcast before. I'm so thrilled. So, thanks, Kent. You've been a great guest and you've given us lots and lots of information. Thanks for being our guest today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. You can find Kent Barner at ciosuite.com, apparently spelled either way, uh, or on LinkedIn. And, and of course, you can always reach out to me and I will be happy to make a warm introduction to my good friend, Kent Barner. This is the Maximize Business Value Podcast, where we give practical advice to business owners on how to build long-term sustainable value in their business. So be sure to tune in each week and follow us wherever you found this podcast and comment. We love your comments and we respond to all of them. Until next time, I'm Tom Bronson reminding you to think about your technology long before you plan to sell your business while you maximize business value. Maximize Business Value podcast with Tom Bronson. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition on their terms. Learn more on how to build long-term sustainable business value and get free value-building tools by visiting our website, www.masterypartners.com. That's master with a Y, masterypartners.com. Check it out. That was perfect. I wouldn't make any changes on that.